Okay. Um, we might just get started. It's just hit 6.30. So um, we might get started. So just a quick run uh, a run sheet here. So we're going to have each member. We've got basically every member of the Mugford family in here as, as well as the winemaker. So uh, everyone's going to say, say their piece. Um, everyone's going to talk about a different wine. But first of all, um, we've got Keith here on, on the main screen who's going to be talking a little bit about Mosswood in general. Um, so Keith, I'll just uh, leave it over to you to start us off. And then, of course, everyone has the ability to take themselves on and off mute. So if you do have, um, if you've got any questions, feel free to, to ask them, absolutely. Um, if you want, you can also put things, if you don't want to uh, say anything, you don't want to interrupt, feel free to just chat something in the, the Zoom group chat. You'll see there's a, a little chat section on the right-hand side. Uh, and then uh, and I can ask the questions of the team as well. So I'll, I'll manage that, Keith and Claire, uh, and I'll yeah. ask you guys the questions. I'll, just, I'll put a bit more light on myself, I think. That's sure, clear totally. about yeah. the pixelation. I'll just do that. Here are the final two. Beautiful, good timing. Is that better? Less pixelated now? That's yeah, it is better. Yeah. Okay. I think it's better. Okie dokie. Sorry about that. I thought it was better without the mark. That's right. So our final two have arrived. So we uh, welcome everyone. And um, as I said, we're just going to start over with, with Keith here, who's on the main screen. And he's going to um, uh, he's gonna give us a quick intro on, um, on the winery. So over to you, mate. Thanks, Mark. So uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. And um, a bit of an uh, introduction and explanation about Mosswood. So um, uh, Mosswood is owned by Claire and me, and uh, we are in the Willie Abrup uh, locality in, in Margaret River, Western Australia. So if you want to look on the map to see where we are, just focus on the very southwest corner of the continent and you'll see a little bit of a toe that sticks out into the Indian Ocean and Mosswood sits uh, sits in there. We are quite literally a mum and dad operation in some respects. If you have a look there, um, apart from Claire and me, you'll see three handsome young men. And they are Alex Cultus, Tristan Mugford and Hugh Mugford. There they are. So Alex, lucky Alex, he's, um, he's not a Mugford. So I think that's a relief for him and everybody else. But he, uh, as you can see by the hairline, yeah, and he's, um, but he's been with a, he's been with Claire and me for uh, a decade now, and uh, so uh, a very important part of what we do. Then Tristan and Hugh are our two sons. Each three, those three blokes are all university graduate winemakers. Alex from Curtin and Tristan and Hugh from Adelaide University. So um, that's our the technical side of our staff. Um, then we, to, just to give you a bit more of a clue about exactly what size we are, we have um, another three or four people who work in the organisation. So all that to say, we're a pretty small place. Claire and I own two vineyards. One's called Mosswood, which was planted in 1969. It's where we, or we are all speaking from now. So Alex, Tristan and Hugh in the winery, Claire and Keith speaking from our house on the property. And uh, Mosswood is a... Uh, roughly um, 14 hectare vineyard in, in total. The original planting here was 1969. Production from here is uh, typically around 100 tonnes. And uh, then we have the Ribbon Vale Vineyard, which is one and a half kilometres south of Mosswood. Uh, that vineyard is about eight hectares. The original planting there was in 1977. So both the vineyards are getting on now in terms of their relative age and um, uh, Mosswood was actually the second commercial vineyard in the in Margaret River's current iteration, Bass Felix being the first. Um, our first vintage here was 1973, so you know, we're approaching 50 years of winemaking now, which is a bit of a surprise really to think how quickly that went by. Um, oh, I beg your pardon, I forgot to add that Ribbonvale, it's a little smaller than Mosswood, Produces slightly less, so you know typically Rivenbow would produce around 180 tons. Uh, we also buy grapes for the Amy's wine, and if you 
tot all that up, any given vintage will produce somewhere between 10 and 12,000 cases. So um, that you know, gives you a bit of a clue as to exactly what size we are. Our vineyards are still all hand maintained, so hand picking, and we still use cane pruning. And uh, human beings are a pretty important part of what we do, really. The machines that are used in viticulture are very efficient, but if quality is your focus, no matter where you are in the world, then you still need to have people doing the jobs. And so we focus really carefully on what we do in the vineyard. And that follows through into the winery. And uh, so we have a very hands-on technique through right through the process. And so, you know, all that to say that we focus every step of the way really on quality. And I know that if any of you have been to a winemaking presentation before, you will know that there is no winemaker anywhere in the world that isn't focusing on quality. And uh, we, uh, we acknowledge that everybody tries, but the reality is that we are genuine and we are really desperately trying to, to produce every year the best quality statement that our vineyards can show. In other words, you know, you're going to see some wines tonight from the 17 and the 18 vintage. And our attempt here is that you're seeing the very best that the vineyards could do and that along the way our winemaking managed to capture all that. So um, quality is our focus. Um, then I think that's probably enough of me rambling and it's probably better now that we actually start talking about the wine. And so um, I can now hand this over to Alex and he can tell us all about the 18 SBS. Okay, Alex, you're on the main screen now. Over to you. Thank you very much, Keith and Mark. Mark, um, just wanted to point out we're uh, videoing through a laptop in the cast cellar, but speaking via our phone. So it might be better if you pin the, the Mosswood Winery. So um, I've got the, yeah, so I've got, I can see all three of you guys on the main screen here now. Can oh, you can. Oh, good. Oh, perfect. Can, everybody, can everybody else? Because I, I can't. I, all I can see is Alex in a big black square. Yeah. Oh, I can see all three. Can you just as, as, as a, on the main screen? Yep. Oh, okay. No, I can't. Every, everybody no, we, else. We, we can't see Alex. We just see his name. Yeah, exactly. That's so, so I think you need to go to the Mosswood screen. Okay. To, um, to see at if you pin the, pin the moss with screen, but I, I can talk, I'm talking via my uh, yeah. earpiece. Yeah. Okay. Trying to give me one second. What we're going to do is we're going to. All right, let's try this again. I'm going to pin that video. Yeah, we're good. Can you see it now? No, we can see um, our. Um, can't remember. Um, we can see. I can see the three boys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Now we can see you guys. Oh, good. That's good. Awesome. And you can hear me. <laughs> good. Perfect. Um, so I'll go into the uh, Riven Vale Sauvignon Blanc semi on that <clears throat> Keith mentioned before. Um, I won't go into the vineyard uh, specifics as Keith's already mentioned, already mentioned that, but um, 2018, somewhat of a, a mild to, to warm growing season. Um, so we, we got everything beautifully ripe without having uh, the extreme heats that we, uh, we don't necessarily want um, during vintage. So um, the, the SBS is a um, Sauvignon dominant blend. So that's about 75% Sauvignon Blanc, 25% Semillon. Um, so the Sauvignon Blanc component we picked um, in late February in 2018 and the Semillon component um, in early March. So I guess stylistically that's um, one of the key drivers with that particular wine is the Sauvignon Blanc component. Um, it's obviously dominant uh, in terms of the percentage in the wine, uh, but it's also picked quite early. Um, so hopefully you've got, got the wine in front of you. Um, you'll sort of see those um, somewhat grassy and, and grapefruit and citrus notes that the Sauvignon Blanc um, gives to the wine, largely as a result of that, that early picking date. Um, 
and then in, in the background you've got uh, the semion notes, uh, which the semion, as I mentioned, is picked a little bit riper. So you've got a bit more of um, your melon characters and your fig um, and whatnot from, from semion. Um, the wine, the Sauvignon Blanc components um, is crushed and then skin contacted in the press. So we're aiming to extract those volatile thiols, which give those sort of passion fruit and lychee and guava notes um, in that wine. And the semion component is whole bunch pressed with a little bit of a solids inclusion as well. So again, just giving that complexity um, throughout the fermentation and, and then into the barrel aging. Um, so both components were, were barrel aged in seasoned oak. Um, so used Chardonnay barrels and they were fermented in barrel and then racked off gross leaves and then transferred uh, back to barrel as a blend uh, where they aged for about four months. So we're trying to incorporate um, some background complexities with the wine without giving, I guess, uh, the new oak components. So you're getting nice textures in the background um, and some, some yeast autolysis notes and bready and doughy um, notes too. Um, so yeah, that, that particular wine, um, for me, the Sauvignon Blanc component stands out quite a lot on the nose. And then I think that also carries through into the palate with the acidity from the Sauvignon Blanc. And then you get this beautiful background um, complexity, both on the nose and also in, in the back of the palate uh, from the Sauvignon that gives it that nice rounded, um, rich feeling on the back palate. Um, if anyone has any comments, you boys can, can throw at me or... Or I've got a question for you, Alex. So, um, by the way, Keith. <laughs> so, 18, pretty good year. Very good year. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, from a winemaking perspective, really no excuses here. No, absolutely none. No, <laughs> um, we we didn't get a lot of. I mean, we had we had good rain coming out of coming out of winter and into early spring. Um, we had a good top up of rain um, in some small falls in January and February. And then we just cruised through um, into the beginning of harvest. So uh, birds weren't a huge threat in 2018, um, unlike, say, the 19 vintage. And we weren't really threatened by big, big downpours of rain. So um, all the fruit so, came off in beautiful condition. So one of, our really, one of our really good ones. And then um, do you want to just give people a bit of an explanation about the use of the small oak and old small oak and fermenting in barrel, the textural issue, just to make that clear? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So with the older oak, I guess, we're not trying to impart uh, the stronger vanilla and, and cedar and spice notes that you get uh, with newer oak. Um, so, but what we are trying to get is some uh, textural complexity from some of the remnant tannins still within the oak. Um, and also, the wine being, I guess, mixed, uh, mixed around and contact with the dead yeast cells inside the barrel, giving some autolytic characters. So the yeast cells actually empty themselves, if you like, um, and release these nice sort of um, bready and, and doughy characters into the wine. Um, and, they, and they often impart a, a sort of a rounder mouthfeel as well. Um, someone sorry. asked. Um, someone asked about uh, age ageability or when it's best to drink the um, the Mosswood Ribbon Vale Sauvignon Blanc Semi on. Um, yeah. What, what do you so, think? So it's it's a wine uh, designed to, to drink uh, not within the near future. Um, so generally, we would would recommend sort of that two to five year mark. Um, but with the semion component, um, I guess we know, Keith and Claire, you know, better than anybody, it's, it's aging ability um, is fantastic with semion. So I think that semion component um, will add, it, add to its age worthiness. Um, and also the acid from the Sauvignon Blanc will, will probably hold it together. So, um, I mean, we've, we've tried several older SPSs that have, well, and back then it was... Uh, um, SBS Semillon Sauvignon Blanc 
um, that have aged, you know, 10, 15 years. So if you are into aging whites, I, I don't see a reason why it wouldn't uh, lay down well. So. Well, certainly that's been our experience, hasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 um, well, Tristan will go into a bit more depth with the, uh, the semion um, as a straight varietal, but um, some of the, uh, the age notes you get off that are, are really quite intriguing and quite pleasant. So, yeah. I've got a question here, guys, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Far away. So, unfortunately, I couldn't source this wine in the UK. I've got all the others, but this is the one I couldn't get. Um, but oh. what, when, when did um, you guys, from what I gather, you're completely bottling under screw cap now. And um, is, is, that, is that right? That's correct, yeah. See, production. just before you go any further, I'll just do a quick introduction. I, I said this to Keith and Claire, but I don't think you guys heard. Uh, this is Alastair Cooper, who uh, is our kind of correspondent over in the in the UK, and he's. Um, you should be. You should all be very, very proud because he was able to source the final three wines, all from the local uh, UK market. So you guys are well represented over there. So um, and and well, Ali, well, well, avid, avid of Margaret River wines, and especially of uh, of Semillon, as I know. I'm so uh, discussion. Yeah. So sorry, mm -hmm. Ali. Please, please go ahead. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, guys, for having me. So, yeah, the guys at Jeroboam's in the UK have been brilliant getting these wines to me. So thumbs Thank up you. to them. Um, and I even had a, a bottle of Amy 17 that I had last night and I've got a little bit left to taste alongside the 18 today. So um, so it's a great way to start the day. But um, the so so my question yeah, regarding screw caps, you, you've gone under total screw cap production. When did you do that and how have you seen the the ageability under screw cap um, versus cork and when did you start doing tests etc. Uh, so the original bottling under screw cap was Mosswood 2000 Cabernet Sauvignon, so we did that in 2002, and uh, on that bottling run, we did 200 dozen of a run of about two and a half thousand, and um, it was a trial, and we had had enough comment from our, from the customer base generally that people were becoming pretty irritated with cork related problems and we thought oh well we'll be able to sell 200 cases uh, it turned out we could easily sell 200 cases in fact uh, the, in that run the the screw cap component sold really really quickly and then the customers were largely irritated when they had to buy it under cork and so we were we were delighted with the response so from then on, we upped the production. So we bottled 70% under screw cap the following year of all the wines. And then within two years, we'd pretty well stopped that, except with Mosswood Cabernet. There was still a hard core of consumers who wanted to drink Mosswood Cabernet under cork, particularly in very traditional markets. Singapore was one. Um, but in the UK, Alistair, uh, the, the screw cap was adopted without really too much fuss and um, in the end the net, the net result has been that we have seen that all the wines from Cabernet Spignon or Semillon or whatever they all develop a similar bottle bouquet as you'd expect under cork. The, uh, the only thing is that um, because the seal is more consistent with the screw cap we, we get less bottle variation so in other words problems with um, Rapid oxidation, you know, so uh, RO is, as we nickname it, that's yeah. that all but disappears with screw cap, and then of course there's the cork tank. So the consistency of the product is significantly improved. It means then that the uh, by and large, the way the wines have evolved since then is that they've developed their normal bottle bouquet, but without the significant variations that we would achieve if you had run the same thing with cork. We, we haven't run a trial for a number of years now because it probably after about the fifth year, we stopped doing it. So we still have some wines in our cellar where we've got the same wine under cork and screw cap. And we, and we look at them every now and then just for curiosity's sake. Amusingly enough, a really good cork probably is a better screw, a seal than a screw cap, but there's so few in percentage terms that... Um, uh, it's just not worth the bother. Uh, and the key for that the is that it has to be a good cork uh, without taint, without TCA. Yeah, I mean, look, 
without wanting to labour the point about the damaging aspects of cork, the reality of it is that um, it would be nice if they're all really good, like the very, very best corks, but they're not. So, Keith, there was a big, there was a big um, tasting that yourself and Claire did in Singapore, wasn't there? Screw cap yes. versus yeah. cork. So that was that was quite an important one from the brand perspective up there because Singapore is a very conservative market, at least traditional buyers are. That Singapore has an interesting collection of customers. So there are the traditional wine buyers who are young people like Claire and me, probably you know fit young people who have essentially have um, had their wine experience courtesy of an education in Britain or maybe the United States, but altogether very traditional in their focus and they in particular they didn't want to see the wine sealed with anything other than cork. On the other hand young Singaporeans many, you know, many of whom probably studied in Australia and certainly uh, travelled quite widely they were far more interested in the closure the screw cap closure and so in the end to try and capture the interest of the former category we ran a big tasting in Singapore where we looked at uh, the same wines under screw cap and cork from uh, the 2003 vintage. And this was done roughly five or seven years ago now. Um, and by then, the result was quite clear that, um, for example, when we looked at the Chardonnay, the 2003 Mosswood Chardonnay, there was one really good bottle under cork. And then there were three awful bottles under cork that were really prematurely developed and one was tainted. Uh, that compared with four really sound bottles on the screw cap, all of which were exactly how you would have liked the Chardonnay to be at that age, so ten, roughly 10 years old. So, and the, the effect was the same across all the varieties. Uh, Chardonnay, it tends to show the RO effect more than the other varieties, but they all do it to a degree. So, out of that, we, we stopped doing cork production for Singapore, and so that ended the court production for Mosswood full stop. We were able now to sell in that market under the screw cap. So in a nutshell, Alice You never looked back. <laughs> no, that's that's great. I think I mean I'm a big fan of screw caps as well. And I think it's um and the UK, as you say, is really a, a, the, there is no issue here in the UK that there are obviously very traditional markets like France, where obviously I, I imagine France isn't a big market for you, but where they're still very reticent. And it's a shame, I think, because there's nothing worse, I imagine, being a winemaker but to, to have that doubt in your mind of, of, of the wine not being um, show, not showing at its best or you not being in control of, of that element of it. I mean, it seems seems so foolish that you can, when you use a cork, you control the quality of the finished product effectively to when the bottle is filled. And then yep. you introduce a, you know, five to 10% minimum failure rate uh, by putting the seal on the top. It just makes no sense. The biggest problem for us as winemakers actually is when we buy French wine, you know, like uh, our mates in Burgundy, you know, we say to them, for God's sake, you know, why would you at least bottle some under screw cap for the Australian market? Their yeah. big complaint, and that this is quite amusing, but their big complaint is that um, their customers, particularly um, expatriate French people working as sommeliers in, say, London or San Francisco or New York, they won't change. They want to have their top Burgundian producers under, under court, not screw cap. And so mm -hmm. we are noticing, though, that a few of them are getting fed up with it, um, meaning fed up with the court damage and that, um, they're increasingly more assertive in going to other closures. So that's a good thing, I think. At least, you know, I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than you know, buying, say, a top-end white burgundy and pulling the cork out, and either it's gone brown or it smells like old carpet. I mean, what a wonderful experience that is. No, I agree. Sorry. Excuse and, uh, me for being direct. Sorry. As, uh, as Danny has said, it's, uh, it, it is very fun to open, but um, yeah, it can, can be costly. Cork makes a lovely noise when you pull it out of the bottle. That's the best thing you can say for it. <laughs> That's great. good for the gaff in the, in the boat. Yes. Okay, so we are going to go across. We're going to go back to um, going to go back to the boys now. Now I've I figured out what the issue is. Why you can't see it? It's because they've got um, they're muted. The main screen is muted, and they're using their phones. So if you are interested in seeing the um so who's going to be speaking next keith is it going to be tristan, tristan? tristan speaking next yeah beautiful so um 
All you need to do is find the image along the top of your screen that has the three guys there. And then there's three little dots in the top corner and you just say pin this video and then they will come up on your main screen as the, um, as the, main, the main image. So Tristan, uh, across to you, mate. So thanks, Mark. So basically, uh, just to finish off the cork debate, the good thing about ScrewCalf is you can open it while camping. So that's the most important part, I think. Um, having said that, so the 2018 uh, Mossad Semion is the wine that I will be talking about. So in terms of the year for me, it was reasonably significant because it was the first year that I'd returned from studying, you know, studying winemaking at a university. So it was my first year back at Mosswood. So this, I guess, in some ways it was uh, significant. Um, but in terms of a year, it was a good year to come back with because it was quite an average year in terms of temperature. So we had a nice growing season, which meant that the wine came in exactly when we wanted it to, which was the 13th of March, as in the median harvest date was the 13th of March. So we had pretty much a, a warm year without it being hot or without it being too cool or too wet. So it was basically ideal in that sense. And in terms of the wine itself, it's quite quite easily made. So we bring it to the winery, we hand sort it, then it goes into the press and it's whole bunch pressed and transferred, to, just transferred into stainless steel and kept at 10 degrees for uh, uh, for two days and then, or 48 hours, and then um, allowed to, so and then turn, put to the next tank and then allowed to warm up to 10 degrees, at which point it's, sorry, uh, 15 degrees, at which point it's um, inoculated fermentation after that, we uh, transfer it to another tank and fine it and then filter it and then put it into bottle. So for us, the Semion is like a very, very easy wine to make, which is lucky because <laughs> all the other wines are quite complicated. So we, it's good to have some time off with that wine. Um, in terms of what we try to achieve with the winemaking style, we try our best to copy the Hunter Valley style. As much as you can't copy the Hunter Valley, we more try and make a Margaret River version. And we find that, the ageability is between drinking right now or drinking at least 10 years in the future. So basically it's designed to put away or drink immediately. So it depends on the buyer's choice there. Uh, that's basically all of the winemaking notes. Um, in just terms a, of the style that we make. A quick question, if I can just quickly butt in, Tristan. Um, yeah. Andrew has asked, how old are the, uh, are the Semillon vines? So Andrew, this is... Uh, Andrew Thomas from the Hunter Valley um, X wine maker at Tyrrells for many years. So he's got a very significant passion for Semyon, I'm guessing. Um, and so, yeah, he's asked, how old are the Semyon vines? They were planted well, 1972. 72. Yeah. Well, sorry, the we've got two blocks. The original, the old block, 1972, and then the later block, 1995. Um, so, but the majority of this wine is coming off the old block, and um, uh, so we there are two the the two parcels are picked separately. And um, so, sorry, sorry, Tristan, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. I, I, no, that's fine. I wasn't so, around yeah. in 1972, so I, I, yeah. I, I don't know if it's actually planted or not. I wasn't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so in terms of the finished wine, basically we look for the sort of stewed apple and cinnamon notes on the nose, and then on the palate they're sort of backed up by some tannin, which is smoothed over by the presence of those uh, notes on the nose. Um, in terms of the wine, that's pretty much all of the main points about how it's made and how it ages. Uh, so yeah, I guess with Moss and Semion, we try to make a new style in Margaret River, but also try and uh, we sort of uh, give the style over to the hunter in the sense that they, they sort of blaze the trail a bit for, for Australian Semion internationally. So yeah, if anyone has any questions at all. I do. Keith, do, do, are your vines on own roots or are they on rootstocks? They're all in their own roots. So you, every everything we planted is all on its own roots. In, in, in Mugger, we're blessed with not needing rootstocks because we're luckily at the moment still don't have philosopher. I've got a question, guys. Just just um, going on from that, how important for you um, is that element of being planted on, on uh, being ungrafted as to being grafted? Do you think that's, how, or essentially, how much do you think that maybe rootstocks might mitigate the effect of terroir? 
Well, well, I can no. say, okay. Sorry. I mean, I, the, t my personal view is that because we're one of the few regions in the world now who can grow vines in their own roots, it, um, it's a bonus and it allows us to show, what do you want to call it, a genuine statement of Semillon. But having, you know, having said that, the rootstock effect can vary. Choice of rootstock is important. So realistically speaking, it's um, choice of rootstock should largely outweigh the problems that might be associated with um, you know, just varying the terroir somewhat. So, um, uh, but overall, we, we're actually still quite proud to say that we, um, we're we growing vines on our own roots. I mean, I've never discussed with you guys. What do you think of it? Sorry about my phone. Well, I, I, I can only allude to the grafting regime that we've just gone through with um, grafting uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon onto the Sauvignon Blanc rootstocks and also some Malbec onto some Sauvignon Blanc rootstocks. And the canopies themselves seem to take, um, well, actually even more recently some Chardonnay. Mm. The canopies seem to take on the rootstocks. Um, main characteristics. Attributes, yeah, main characteristics if you like. So uh, where you've got uh, Sauvignon Blanc vines that are extremely vigorous um, and we've put some Chardonnay or some Malbec on top of it and it, it, it goes ballistic. So and in terms of crop load and also in terms of um, shading within the canopy due to big shoots and big leaves and all that sort of thing. So um, it, it probably is affecting um, the terroir in, in that sense for me. Um, so I think we're, we're quite blessed in that in that regard to be able to grow on own roots because you're, you're reflecting mostly um well not mostly you're always reflecting that variety rather than some of the rootstock attributes so i don't know if it yeah that mm -hmm. right. it, had, it has been a big eye opener hasn't it for us with um with the grafting has been a big eye opener we have tried grafting on semion too and it's it's a very bad rootstock <laughs> All right. Well, uh, why you, sorry to interrupt, um, Claire. Why do you think that might be that Semillon's not doesn't perform as well as a rootstock? We we don't know. It's just um, for, for us, it's been a fact. We, it's not something we had been warned about when we started doing this little bit of grafting that we do. But um, it just it, the grafts just don't take very well at all, and we've been thrilled with the um, the effect we've had with the grafting onto Sauvignon Blanc. It's, um, it, yeah, as Alex says, it's very vigorous and, um, and they t have taken beautifully. Um, our most recent grafts were um, up at Ribbonvale, uh, some Chardonnay, and honestly, we grafted those in September and we could have picked some fruit off them um, this vintage. Uh, it, 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 they were vigorous and they were producing bunches. Not, not enough to make anything with, but um, it was very impressive. Very comfortable, yeah, interesting. Mm. Just a comment, I think it's a, it's a delicious wine, guys, but you should be really proud of this, it's gorgeous. Um, talking about the style, it's, it, on my label here, it says it's 14% alcohol, um, and it seems to carry that alcohol effortlessly. Um, and obviously in contrast to the style of Hunter where you'd expect considerably less alcohol. Um, it, it's quite astonishing how this still has that freshness and verve. And it does seem more evolved. It has already got that nutty character coming through, whereas in the Hunter, I wouldn't expect that to come through for, for you know, five, six years perhaps. Um, but with the alcohol, when are you picking dates and how are you managing that alcohol so well? The, the reason the alcohol is higher than you would expect from the, um, the hunter is because we pick later. We wait for phenological ripeness and we um, can do that here. Um, and so we maintain the acid and we pick in balance um, and we get that um, mid to high 12 BOMA. Um, so no, 12 to 13 BOMA, excuse me. And um, we, we wait for that because we want the, the richness of the fruit ripeness 
and um, to get the texture that you can see in the wine. So it's something that is very um, different to uh, Margaret River, our region, than um, to the hunter, with that ability to be able to pick it with the, at a higher ripeness and a lower, a, a lower but balanced acidity. And I think it, it still has the same ageability. Um, my most thrilling experience as a young person in wine was opening 10-year-old um, Semyon in London at the London Trade Show. Um, and it um, was just so exciting, the reaction you get to, um, from people to that really um, just maturing old Semyon. Very good. It adds richness. Now, um, just a few comments here. So uh, Danny's just mentioned that he, Tomo, you'll like this one. He, um, he enjoys the Andrew Thomas Braymore, of course. Who of us, who doesn't? That is a fantastic wine. Um, I think Ali, even, even that's one of your favorites, over in, even, even over on the other side of the world. And then uh, Peter has, has asked to you guys, is global warming increasing the alcohol content over where you are in the Margaret River? No. That's definitely case. <laughs> so, I mean, it's um, the alcohol content, it's not a direct association with the, um, uh, we'd say global warming per se. I mean, it, um, you can still pick the fruit at a, an appropriate ripeness. And if you were concerned that uh, alcohol is becoming a problem, then um, you, know, you can manage the vineyard to pick a little earlier. So I don't really see that the two are necessarily directly related. Um, the only thing that can happen, I suppose, is if there's a particularly warm spell, uh, the sugar ripeness can accumulate quite quickly and then you finish up with a higher alcohol content than perhaps you wanted if for some reason or other you couldn't get in there and pick. But by and large, alcohol contents are more of a, uh, a current day management issue rather than a long-term climate thing. Um, there are, you, know, you can manage a vineyard so that it doesn't have a problem. I mean, the, the other thing is that really the, the changes in temperature associated with um, uh, global warming as such are pretty slow. So it's not a, to be frank, it's not having a big impact in Margaret River at the moment. So uh, in fact, we've experienced a period of cooling over the last five years. So it's not, you know, it's a long complicated story that one but no I don't think it's there are management issues associated with final levels of alcohol that are not really associated with things like um, the big picture of climate change okay excellent thank you Keith and um, Peter I hope that uh, that answered your question um, now Claire's just asked quickly here does does that alcohol content inhibit the longevity of the wine which is a great question no no I mean that in fact the the two styles, the Hunter style and the Margaret River style, actually converge over the over the ageing process. So the bottle bouquet that is classic in the old Hunters where there's lots of butter and caramel and toast, that appears or that develops in the Margaret River wines as well and roughly over the same time frame. So we have a rough rule of thumb that for the bottle bouquet to develop to a reasonable extent, it's got to be... Uh, to allow to uh, say cellar between five and ten years and if you want the bottle bouquet to be the dominant feature in the wine then somewhere between 10 and 20 years so long-term cellaring definitely um, we recommend the wine for long-term cellaring and it's over a similar kind of range that people would typically recommend for hunt similar. Excellent and um, if you wouldn't mind uh, Tomo would you mind uh, a couple of comments um, I'd love to hear your thoughts as one of Australia's kind of preeminent semion producers. Um, I'd be really keen to hear your feedback on, obviously these, they're, they're very, very different wines, but um, your thoughts, if that's all right. Absolutely. Are we on off mute? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> we can hear you crystal clear, Andrew. Oh, cool. Um, look, obviously uh, semion is a, um, a passion of mine and um, 
Mark and Claire and, and the whole crew, I salute you because, uh, for, for bottling a varietal semion because, you know, it's not an easy sell and it's not a, it's not a, um, uh, a, a big um, category of the wine industry. But um, one of the things that um, I do know is that those that do semion really well will bottle a varietal semion, which you've done here. Um, in terms of the difference between um, what you've produced here and, and generally what we do in the Hunter, um, they are, you know, kind of chalk and cheese, despite the fact that we've made them in, in you know, from a winemaking point of view, pretty, pretty similar ways. You know, it's whole bunch pressing, um, you know, no oak. Um, neutral yeast, relatively um, cool fermentation, bottled um, within, you know, a few months of, of uh, the end of fermentation to try and capture that freshness and vibrancy that exists in Semion. Um, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this wine and what I, and, and Kim too, uh, and what we love about this wine is the difference, you know, it's, 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 um, ones like this just go to show that Semyon can't be sort of boxed into, okay, that's what Semyon's all about. This wine's 14% or thereabouts. Um, Hunter Semyon is 10.5%, let's say, or thereabouts. Um, they're both made in a pretty similar way, but stylistically, you know, this wine, um, what I love about this wine is it has a little more sort of um, textural depth and complexity than Hunter Semion, particularly in its youth. It's, it has a, certainly has a slightly gentler um, acidity. Um, and um, what, is, what are we talking, um, 2018? You know, to my mind, um, this wine's, you know, if you're going to enjoy the, the freshness and vibrancy of the youth of this wine, um, you know, do it over the next sort of six to 12 months. Otherwise, put it down for... And Keith, Claire, you guys tell me, but I would imagine, like Hunter Semion, it will go through a bit of an awkward stage between neither freshness and vibrancy of youth nor bottle age complexity for, I don't know, let's say three years. But on the other side of that, I think it's going to be looking pretty good. So, um, you know, um, cheers to you from the, from the other side of the continent. Um, drinking Semion, we're really enjoying this here tonight. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Andrew. Here's very a question nice. for you, Andrew. Andrew, how do you get people to buy Semion? There's a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, when that's all you make, <laughs> choice. <laughs> I do have to um, say that thanks to the um, uh, the Andrew in the UK um, because. Uh, Really, our UK market for Semillon is is very very good, and the reason he couldn't get the Sauvignon Blanc Semillon, I think, is possibly because um, their their preference is for Semillon. So good on them. It is well, no, no, no. no. <laughs> um, I do, Andrew. Thank you very much for for that input, mate. I really really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm sure you, you didn't expect us to, to be answering questions here, but I really, I really appreciate it, mate. Um, okay, I can see there's, there's a, few, um, a few empty wine glasses here, so we might move on to the next, uh, to our first red for the evening, to the Mosswood Amy's. So we're going to be going across to, um, is Hugh? Yeah, it's yeah. me, in the middle. Okay. Yeah, so, so if, you pin, if you pin the, uh, the Mosswood screen with the three of us, then you'll see us. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll chat chat about the um, 2018 Mosswood Amy. So um, it come it's the uh, the only wine that we buy fruit in for. So um, it doesn't come from either the Mosswood or Ribbon Vale vineyards. It um, comes from a uh, property called Glenmore, which is owned by um, Ian Bell, who um, is most famous for being my godfather. Um, which is very important, but um, he's also uh, the former um, assistant winemaker here at Mosswood. So he was with us for 20, 25 years. I think Keith will, Keith will butt in in a second, tell me exactly. 21 how years, Hugh. There you go. So 20 to 25 was good. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, he owns that property um, and it was originally um, owned by his grandmother, 
um, Amy Beers, and she um, was a very dear friend of the family. Um, and uh, Ian planted vines on it. Um, and when um, those were yeah, yeah, exactly. We call it sand dune country when we're when we're taking the piss out of Ian. But um, uh, he planted vines on it, and uh, we, um, well, mum and dad um, started buying the fruit. And um, when Ian started producing his own wine um, under the Glenmore label, we needed to. Um, this wine was originally the Mosswood Glenmore Cabernet, and it needed a new name. And so um, they decided to name it after after Amy, um, and hence the name. Um, but um, so anyway, the, the, the vineyard's located about 10 kilometres north of, of Mosswood, so um, slightly warmer and, Alex, as Alex mentioned, slightly sandier soils. Um, but it's a, it's a Cabernet blend, so um, 76% Cabernet, um, 8% Merlot, 8% Malbec and 8% Petit Verdot. So um, I'll get to the, the um, tasting notes in a minute, but um, the uh, blend um, is such because we're trying to... Um, I guess, differentiate it from the other Cabernets in our range. So the Mosswood Cabernet and the Ribbonvale Cabernet uh, by making it in more of a um, younger um, drink now style. So um, the blending varieties give it um, the, um, I guess, the ability to be drunk earlier. Um, and uh, so that's the, the makeup. So for the 2018 vintages, the boys have mentioned, um, it was a, um, a pretty much bang on average year so we achieved full ripeness across all the varieties so that means for us 14 and a half by may um generally um and that's what we achieved in in each of the varieties um the fruit was delivered to the winery uh or hand picked initially delivered to the winery hand sorted um and then must pumped into um, static fermenters where um it was pumped or initially inoculated with um m2 yeast and then um uh, fermented in those static fermenters where it was pumped over um, three times a day, then we pressed it out, um, allowed it to finish malolactic fermentation and alcoholic fermentation, and then put it to barrel um, for 18 months. So um, another key aspect of this wine is um, in sort of sticking with the um, desire to um, make it um, or give it uh, drinkability at a younger age. We don't want any overt inf oak influence in this. So there's no new oak in that blend. It's all um, old um, two 28 litre um, barriques. Um, so it stays in those barrels for 18 months. Um, uh, and then we, um, we uh, racked it all out, um, ran finding trials, decided not to find it. Um, so this one's unfined and then it was filtered and bottled. Um, so what we've ended up here, up with here, um, is um, a really bright, um, I guess still youthful, um, but um, pleasant um, drink now Cabernet. So, um, the characteristics that I sort of pick up in this wine, or the, the hallmarks of it are, are really bright fruit notes. So um, red currants, um, blackberries and mulberries on the nose. Um, there's a bit of a, a, a white spice note from the, from the Malbec. Um, and you can see the influence of the Petit Verdot with um, a dew sort of character in there. Um, and then on the palate, um, really good length, great fruit concentration. Um, and once again, I, I get a lot of um, licorice, um, red currant, um, those sorts of characters. And as, as I sort of mentioned, there's, there's no overt oak there, um, but you know, you've got nice firm tannins and, and a pretty good acid balance, I think. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to achieve with this wine. I hope everyone enjoys it. Do we have any questions? Fantastic, thanks mate. That's great. No, it's a cracker, absolute cracker. So any, questions. <laughs> any questions from anyone? Uh, Ali, keen to hear your, your feedback from um, across the ponds. <laughs> Andrew, that is fantastic. You've nailed it there. I think uh, effing delicious, nice one. That's, I, I, I'd agree with that. It, uh, what I love, and I've, I'm, I'm the lucky one here. I, I, as I say, I opened the 17 Amy's last night as well, so I could do a little comparison. And I left a tiny bit in the bottle to be tasting alongside. And I want to say them, that's, that's a very empty bottle for 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I finished it at about 2 o'clock this morning. So, yeah, it's only been open seven hours. Um, the... What I love about both of, the, both of these vintages, as you say, is the vibrancy and... and 
the value for money, I think these are 12, 13 pounds over here in the UK and they really over deliver for me on, on, on value for money. So yeah, truly delicious wines that I think I imagine will age really quite nicely, but it's so beautiful in their youth with that vibrant fruit. Um, now I'm, I, I love South American wine. So that's one of my specialities. And what are your thoughts on, on Malbec? How much Malbec is planted in the Margaret river? Would you like to see more? Do, does anyone do any varietal Malbec in, in Margaret river? And um, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on Malbec? Uh, well, yeah. there is a, there's a little bit planted here. The um, sorry, you, uh, the, there's a little bit planted in Margaret River. There were, we used to have some troubles in the early years with poor fruit set, so it was actually in the Mosswood Vineyard um, up until 1980. Then we pulled that block out and placed it with Chardonnay. Uh, so it's it's good here. Definitely um, contributes a significant component for Cabernet blending. Um, yeah. It's just it gives reliably ripe fruit characters and re, and also ripe tannins in virtually every year. So it, that means it's particularly useful in the cool years. The wines will always have generosity. Um, it's pretty interesting though. Like it, it has a tendency to crop quite heavily, and um, we're growing it now at the Ribbonvale Vineyard, and so we have to keep an eye on the amount that it actually produces because it ripens fairly slowly, and uh, uh, so it's needs to be managed. It's sort of like the, the semion of red grapes, really. Um, it's uh, pretty prodigious with what it can do. Um, so I think you might find it will be, may make a, an appearance in more wines in Margaret River over the next decade, um, but probably mostly as a blender for Cabernet Sauvignon. I, I don't know anybody who's thinking about doing the Argentinian thing and making it as a varietal. But, but I, you know, the other guys might have more idea about that than me. I've heard yeah, a, um, I've heard a wine from uh, one of one of your mates down the road, uh, Will Berliner at um, at Cloudburst. Yeah, great Malbec, and I, I got the great opportunity to try, and it was absolutely outstanding. It was truly, truly, truly something special. So you, you used that week's paycheck, did you, Matt? <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, he, he had an open bottle, and I got a little taste. <laughs> That's good. It is it is a very nice wine. Yes, yeah. and he's a nice guy. He's a lovely man. So, but I just sorry, just just to finish that point, um, just from um, a, you know the perspective of, of someone that, that leaves the house, unlike the old man, um, yeah. I, th I think I think they are um, cropping up, um, as in the, the straight varieties are uh, cropping up a bit more um, out of Margaret River. Um, I know um, I've I've had a couple um, house, of cards. house of cards. Yeah, Mark, we'll just do some promotion for other wineries, but. Yeah, um, but yeah, no. I think I think they are appearing a bit more, um, and I I've had a quite had a few that I quite like. So um, yeah, I think there's potential there. So so just just to wrap it up, um, some expletives from uh, Mr. Andrew Thomas on the chat there, saying how delicious it is. But um, <laughs> that's uh, we'll we'll let that we'll let that pass. Um, so we might, if it's all right with everyone, we'll go on to our uh, our fourth wine. The, uh, the Mosswood Cabernet. Now we're going to talk to, uh, is this Keith or Claire or the two of you together that's going to be going to be talking about this one? Keith. Uh, Keith, no, me, okay. Uh, Keith, and probably with me interjecting. Absolutely, we Quite can unusual. switch between the screens, that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll start with you, Keith. Okay, all right, so you, please, everybody, you'll forgive us if we have a husband and wife moment where um. tension fills the air, but we should be okay. So, so 2017 uh, turned out to be a terrific year for the Margaret River region generally, but it, it was not without its challenges because it was a, a, a very mild summer. So um, uh, we, um, we were watching over the horizon with a fair bit of interest as the season went on because we needed, you know, we, we, were, we were worrying that we may struggle to get fruit right. So, um, to be more clear about that, we, we experienced a relatively mild and often damp autumn in Margaret River. And so although the heat summations suggest that the region is relatively reliable and straightforward for ripening Cabernet Sauvignon, in fact, it can be difficult in some years. And so if we have a late flowering and then where our harvest dates for Cabernet Sauvignon get pushed out into April, 
then that's when we are exposed to potentially limiting conditions like lower temperatures and rain. So uh, 2017 was a beautiful year, as in the summer in particular was absolutely delightful. And uh, um, so I suppose, well, uh, we may have had a fewer beach days because it wasn't all that hot. Um, but overall, it was, it was, the conditions were, were really good. But come the end of March, we were still looking fairly anxiously out to see how things would go for ripeness. Anyway, the um, Mother Nature did the right thing in the end, and we had a classic West Coast Indian summer. So the rain finished, the sun came out, and really for, uh, from about the, I don't know, the end of the first week of April through until about the end of May, we had really beautiful autumnal conditions. So all that to say that all, it, it was a close-run thing, but Cabernet Sauvignon achieved full ripeness in the end. So we, we consider it to be a really good season for Cabernet in Margaret River. For Mosswood, uh, it is similar to a wine like the 1990, that the, although they're, you know, they're completely unrelated really, the reality is that they've got some really interesting similarities. And so that, that was also an encouraging sign for us as we're going through the season. So yep, we had a good year. Therefore, there's no excuses from a winemaking perspective. And uh, um, so we went through our usual processes. The boys have outlined them really. We pick everything by hand and then we sort by hand. And then uh, all of the Cabernet Sauvignon fermentations are small batch, open tanks, hand plunged. Uh, the blending varieties are treated the same way too. So Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot are the two blending varieties for this wine. They all spend around two weeks on skins. We don't have any strict recipe there. We just taste each batch as it's progressing and pick according to the balance of tannin. So when I say around 14 days on skin, some batches might have been 12 days, some might have been 18 days. It just depends on how they go. Uh, then uh, after primary fermentation and uh, malolactic into small French oak barrels. So our standard size is 228 litres. Uh, with Mosswood Cabernet, we use 15% new barrels. So we're looking for a very small contribution from the oak barrels themselves, but we age for an extended period in barrel because we like the way the wine develops in barrels. So this wine went into barrels in um, at the end of April, beginning May 2017, and it came out in October 2019. So roughly two and a bit years in oak. And our finishing, uh, before we bottle, we always do fining trials, but with the 17, when we did the trials, the, we didn't improve the, the overall balance of the wine with any of the fining agents. So it was uh, unfined and then um, sterile filtered into bottles. So uh, very, very standard technique for Mosswood Cabernet. And the result in the glass, I think, looks something like this. So the Cabernet Sauvignon component, because it, it is the reasonably mild year that we were talking about. Cabernet Sauvignon keeps some of its prettier aromas. So Mosswood always smells a bit like blueberries, blackberries, red currants. So there's plenty of the blueberries in particular, but also there's some more ethereal fragrances in the 17 and, and they are raspberry, pomegranate, violets. So there's plenty of life sort of effervescent fruit aroma in, from Cabernet Sauvignon in 17. Cabernet Franc typically has a cherry-like fruit note. So there's a bit of that cherry, maybe summer pudding. Um, and then the Petit Verdot is making, in my view, a fairly significant contribution in the 17 and that the, there is a musky, dark jube character from that variety. And it, uh, it's in this blend at, I think, 7%. You blokes can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and eight. Eight percent. There we go. Uh, not a big part of the blend, but it has a significant impact. You know, lots of that it's bigger than usual. It's usually about 4%, but um, this has only got 88% Cabernet and 8% um, Petit Verdot and 4% Cabernet Franc, I think. Yeah, so, so that makes 17 a bit of a, um, a step. Or, yeah, slightly different from previous vintages. And on the palette, it shows off its mild season again with its really bright fruit flavours like 
really zesty, the dark fruits in particular. Acidity is fairly high um, and uh, concentrated tannin. So Mosswood Cabernet Sauvignon, no matter what the year, it really has strongly dominant tann tannins. It's usually, it should be well balanced even as a baby. So the 17 is no exception. I think the only th other comment I'd make about the 17 as it, as it shows today is that when you first open it, it's a little bit shy. And I reckon that's part of that tightness of structure and high acidity is just restraining it a little. And um, the longer it's in the glass or the longer the bottle is open, the more the, uh, the in particular, the nose starts to lift. And uh, so, you know, overall, we're really thrilled with it. You know, we compare it to 1990 in terms of style. 1990, one of the very best Mosswood vintages, so we have the same high, high expectations. Centering wise we have a rule of thumb that if you want to see a reasonable amount of the bottle bouquet from Cabernet Sauvignon, then keep it if you can for 10 years. Uh, it needs that long to develop the um, cigar box type things, tobacco, cedar, tar, all that sort of stuff. And then um, if you want full bottle bouquet, that usually appears somewhere after 20 years. So in between, uh, it's a bit of a continuum. Some bottles more developed than others. Um, and then for the very long-term cellaring, well, you know, the, uh, at the moment, the Mosswood Cabernet's, the originals are starting to get close to 50 years. So maybe I think that uh, 2017 should match up with those pretty well. Now, I guess if you look back, young vines, inexperienced winemaking, um, if they were able to get through the way they did, then I think the wines from the modern year should be able to last as long. So altogether, we... Uh, if there's another 2017 coming around next year, we'll take it. Don't worry. You should be very proud of that wine there, Keith and Claire, and the whole, the whole uh, Mugford clan. It looks absolutely fantastic. Um, Thank you very much. Now, uh, do we have any, any questions while, we, uh, while we're still going here? Um, Danny's asked um, Kim and, and uh, Tomo's young, young son to go to bed, so... <laughs> Uh, I've, got a, I've got a question, Mark, if that's all right. Alastair, absolutely. Over to you. Yeah. Um, firstly, again, I've just got to echo that. That's an absolutely gorgeous wine. Um, and drinking beautifully now, the tannins are there. But what I, what I love about this wine is, is its approachability already. I've had this in Bicanta for an hour, an hour and a half. And it's just, oh, it's, the tannins are firm, as you say, but so approachable in its youth. And I'd love to see this in... 20, 30 years, but I don't think I could keep my hands off the bottle long enough. Um, but one of, the, one of the things I adore about um, Margaret River Cabernet and, and Mosswood Cabernet is the handling of the pyrazine character from that you seem to manage there. It always seems so, um, it, it's present, but, but always seems to have a ripeness and plushness to it. Um, how, how do you go about managing the pyrazines? I imagine leaf plucking is a key part of that in, in the vineyard it's all done in the vineyard and how how do you see that that is managed so well in in, in margaret river and especially in your wines ali would you mind just confirming for um for everyone what what you mean by that pyrocene character please yeah the the, the so me uh, without going to to detail that sort of green leafy character um that you get in in the cabernet great specifically well cabernet sauvignon and cabernet franc um which can be and Carmen H can be overriding um, and can be a little bit too herbaceous and green. Um, but I always find it in Margaret River, but find it in such an attractive, in attractive way. Um, well, I think, I mean, the other guys will have an opinion about this too, but the, there, we see that as having an answer in a, several different parts, Alistair. So um, part of it's site related. So Mosswood is a relatively warm location in Margaret River. We're on an, north and east facing slope and out of the prevailing wind. Uh, so we probably have a vineyard that um, enjoys a warmer temperature, so, you know, slightly warmer for, compared with the rest of the district. And then we're really fussy with our canopies. So on all of our old plantings, uh, which were, uh, uh, let's not bore ourselves with the details, but all, all the old plantings are on the Scott Henry trellis. So really significant fruit exposure, and all of our new plantings are 
on um, simple vertical shoot positioning, but with rod pruning, so um, reasonable distribution of fruit and leaves. And we do leaf plucking, yep, if we need to. So 2017, we leaf plucked on the, um, the vertical shoot position trellis. Scott Henry, by, by, the, by, way, by the way it sets up, it doesn't really need to be leaf, to have any leaf removal, but uh, we consider that to be pretty important. Um, so combine those two things, you know, the vineyard's pretty good, the trellising systems work pretty well. We also, you know, mosswood isn't cropped heavily. It's an unirrigated vineyard. Both mosswood and ribbon bale are dry farmed. So our yields are not excessive. Uh, obviously, what I'm getting at here is that uh, the heavier the crop, the longer it's going to take to ripen. So we've managed that as well. So a few things like that, I think, all okay. come together to manage it. Thanks very much, Keith. No worries. Thanks, Keith. So Danny... Um... Danny has said how uh, he, he's, he agrees with you, Alistair. He's going to find it hard to keep his hands off it for the next few years. This is why we, uh, we sent you guys a half bottle and a full bottle. So <laughs> the half bottle potentially for tonight to, uh, to get a taste and then hopefully you can hold on to it for a little while longer. But um, I could only get a full bottle, unfortunately, so oh, tonight poor I will have to, I have to finish this tonight. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, so here we go. Andrew uh, Tomo has asked here that, or you know, his 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 partner Kim's asked um, hectare liters per hectare. What's your what's your tonnage that you get off your um, off your vineyard for that cabin? I'm guessing just for the cabinet there, Kim. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. So um, the cabinet yields at uh, just under seven and a half tons a hectare. Um, so long term average, I think, is about seven point three or something um this year we were down around five tons a hectare so you know, we, we do get fluctuations um petit verdot tends to be around five to six tons a hectare cabernet franc about the same so that that's our yield range and um we're noticing that as the vines are getting older the yields are beginning to diminish a, a little bit now so those vines have been in the ground for 50 years are starting to be um Physically, you can see they're changing and, and their yields are changing with it. So, yep, yeah, you know, good rule of thumb, seven to seven and a half tons, of he tons per hectare, Mosswood Cabernet. And um, uh, I don't know, we, we like to see it at around that, to be honest. We've, over the years, we've had complications with the young, particularly the very small crops because the, the tannin structure tends to be a bit more dense and quite as well balanced as Mosswood can be as a youngster. Um, so, you know, I, I quite like good yield on Cabernet if we can get it. Fantastic. Hope that um, answers the questions there for you, Kim. Um, so any more, any more questions? Dan, Danny's asked what's the, um, potentially not wine related here, but uh, Claire, what's the uh, animal on your shirt? <laughs> it's an eagle. It's an eagle. <laughs> Claire, you've got to tilt it down. No one can see it. Sorry? Stand up. I hope it's not a West Coast eagle. <laughs> yes, let's say it's a West Coast eagle. Ah, perfect. Very good. Okay. Ta -da. <laughs> okay, so um, any any other questions we've got here? Because we uh, we're getting to the end of our um, end of our hour here. Um, I think we've gone a little bit over, but that's all right. And I think we've all enjoyed ourselves. Um, just wanted to say thank you so much to um, to the whole Mugford clan, obviously, um, and and also to Alex, of course. Uh, thank you for for dialing in from WA. Uh, thank you for for offering us your time here tonight. Um, I know I've learned several things here. Thank you also to everyone else from from all over Australia and all over the world. Indeed, Alistair from the UK. Thank you everyone for dialing in. This has been a fantastic. Um, Fantastic way to uh, to taste wines together and to to kind of create a little community together despite our separation geographically. So um, thank you everyone for being a part of it, and um, plenty more to come. Every week we're doing something, so uh, keep an eye out. Um, we're doing Italian wines for the next few weeks. 
So, um, and any any final questions before we sign off for, for this um, for this evening here? Not for me. Thanks for having us. So, sorry, I just want to say thank you so much. And the, the wines are truly world class and you should be very proud. Oh, oh well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Well done, guys. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you very Kim. much. Thank thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Feedback, Andrew and Kim. <laughs> Likewise, I'd just to say, like, like to say thank you. Thank you so much. It's the best way I could possibly start a Thursday. Is <laughs> 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 so, um, thank you guys. It's great to get all your thoughts, amazing input, and yeah, really, truly world class wine. So, thank you very, very much for, for, for teaching us all. I've learned lots today, so thank you. Well, good on you. Thanks, LSD. All right, very welcome. Yeah. So, and um, Claire's just showing off now. She's just saying that she's about to have a lamb roast. So, oh, <laughs> that. Jealous, uh, jealous over here. So, um, all right, guys. Thank you. Thank you once more. <laughs> cheers. A final cheers to everyone. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest. Cheers. Go Eagles. Coming. Yeah, go Eagles. <laughs> sorry oh, sorry about this one, Andrew. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Thanks again, Mark. See you, team. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.